I don't got nothing. No static. Shit. Base, this is Alice. Over. We need extraction. Over. I guess we are on our own. The point of having a portable phone, idiot, is that it works when you need it. I have a power cable for it. Yeah, and I have a cigarette lighter that doesn't work. Oh. Did you try your cell phone again? Yeah, it's dead. You used up all the batteries. So this week, we've got some pretty great news in the world of horror. We're going to start off with the news that I'm pretty sure everybody's been talking about. And that's the fact that, well, it's been 13 years since we had a Friday the 13th movie. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> that it's been a full 13 years since the release of the last Friday the 13th movie. Well, I think they timed that because we got news... Producer Roy Lee has provided us with an interesting tease for the Friday the 13th franchise. So Roy Lee was in an interview and tells the Boo crew in an exclusive chat, you may be hearing something by year's end on that front. And that's in relation to Friday the 13th. So it looks like we're going to be getting some news on the Friday the 13th franchise by the end of this year, which is super exciting considering that, you know, all the red tape and legalities around the rights issues have been finalized now. It was actually back in 2018 that a judge ruled Victor Miller owns the rights to the original Friday the 13th screenplay in the United States, which is a decision that Sean Cunningham had failed to overturn in the years that followed. However, Cunningham owns the character of adult Jason Voorhees, which was introduced in later sequels. So eventually, the two will have to work together if they want to use the adult Jason Voorhees character in any Friday the 13th movies going forward. And on the video game front, we have some really exciting news that is going to be coming out soon surrounding one of my favorite new games this year, Evil Dead. Evil Dead the game. And if you've been following me on Twitch, you know I've been playing this in the past and it's a fun game. Absolutely love it. They just released last month, I think it was, the Army of Darkness DLC, which gave you the Castle Kandar map and new premium outfits for your characters. But now they're teasing us with a second DLC update. They said that they'll have news very soon. Saber Interactive notes in regards to the next DLC update that we'll have news for you about this very soon. Keep an eye on our socials. They also note that two upcoming DLC chapters will be included in the game season pass, both of which are going to feature new characters, outfits, and more. So I'm excited about that. New characters. I wonder what characters we are going to see come in from the Evil Dead universe in upcoming DLC. What do you guys think? Send me a message on Instagram, Discord, whatever, with your thoughts, theories, and opinions on what the new DLC update for Evil Dead's going to be. In horror movie news this week, we actually got something pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. Bloody Disgusting has partnered with Screenbox to bring a sequel to theaters nationwide this fall before it arrives on the Screenbox streaming platform. What movie is that? That's Terrifier 2. Art the Clown is back! And I am so excited. It has been so long since we've seen Art the Clown. And the fact that we're getting a sequel to Terrifier just goes to show how much the horror community can push to get more gruesome stories about a fucking killer in a horror movie. Because there's no way Terrifier should have gotten a sequel. It's a great movie. Don't get me wrong. I love it. It's one of the greatest gore porn, body torture, whatever you want to call it movies. But man, to have another one... <laughs> That's fucking great. You know it's going to be a gory sequel. It's going to hit the UK Fright Fest on Monday, August 29th. So you know that it's going to be coming out very shortly after on Screenbox. So, and on the music front, one of my favorite bands of all time has just released a new music video, Ice Nine Kills. I love me some Ice Nine Kills. They just released a psycho-themed music video for their song The Shower Scene, which is off the Silver Screen 2 Welcome to Horrorwood album. Spencer Charnas, of course, big-time horror fan. Like, if you know Ice Nine Kills, you know Spencer Charnas, you know how much he's not only a horror fan, but has contributed to the horror community as a whole. In the music video, Charnas plays himself. He's on trial for murder. And it's here that the video cuts loose with the notable horror cameos. Guess who's in this music video? We have horror host Joe Bob Briggs. I love, love this guy. And he presides over the courtroom as the judge and brings his drive-in totals to the case. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. There's also Ricky Dean Logan from Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, Scout Taylor Compton from the Rob Zombie Halloweens, and, and, <laughs> literally one of my favorite horror actors, period, end of sentence. I love this man with every fiber of my being, Bill Mosley. Bill fucking Mosley. 
I love Bill Mosley. Can we just have a moment here to appreciate the, the man that Bill Mosley is? I absolutely love every role he's in, whether it was in the the Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses movie with the Firefly family or Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. He was incredible. He was in Repo Genetic Rock Opera and did absolutely fantastic. Personally, I'm, I'm a huge Bill Mosley fan. So it was really exciting to see him in this music video, just being his awesome self and that voice he has. I love his voice. I, I don't know what it is. I hope Bill Mosley becomes a voice actor when he can't act anymore because, man, his voice is just perfect. I love it. So that wraps us up for this week in horror. So let's head on over to our horror movie trope for this episode, which is the isolation horror trope. Isolation in horror movies, it's a trope that's evolved throughout the decades. As technology advances and we see society change to adapt, there are many unique methods that filmmakers can use to create that intense atmosphere of isolation. This trope has been used so many times that it's now become a subgenre itself within horror. Isolation horror movies are a simple and timeless method of telling a story. It's the human element versus the evil in the world. And it's a trope that allows the audience to easily identify themselves as the lonely protagonist who has to rely on themselves, sometimes with only a small group of survivors. The isolation trope, it can be dated back as far as the classics of horror with Psycho in 1960 and other iconic horror movies such as Texas Chainsaw Massacre or The Shining. These movies dropped the protagonists at remote houses with no access to landlines, and these characters were removed from help or contact with the outside world, and that adds to the suspense and element of horror in these isolation films. The trope has also been used in other subgenres of horror, like the 1999 found footage film The Blair Witch Project. Those group of characters were trapped in a forest with no cell phones, GPS trackers, even though this was during the time where these items of technology were becoming more prevalent. This means that as technology changes, the way that filmmakers develop the isolation trope in their movies also needs to adapt. Otherwise, the audience just won't be able to relate with the protagonist being isolated because the whole time they're just going to be yelling, where, where, where's your cell phone? <laughs> How do you not have a cell phone? Modern horror films, they've had to work a lot harder in keeping the characters from calling the police or surviving a masked maniac with a chainsaw. Now, there's one movie that stands out from the rest, and that is Jordan Peele's Get Out. I know I've discussed before how this movie is a masterclass in horror for any filmmaker, and that includes the connection this movie has to the isolation trope. Because halfway through the movie, the protagonist, Chris Washington, he realizes he's in deep shit, <laughs> right? Throughout the movie, he keeps noticing that his phone is being unplugged from the charger repeatedly. This is a very unique way to bring the isolation horror trope into the modern age, especially with the trope of cell phones always being dead when you need them the most. This trope in Get Out stands in for much of what the character experiences in the film. It's controlling and malicious for someone to mess with his battery life, and he can't entirely prove if it's being done on purpose, which adds to the paranoia that's needed for the isolation trope to be successful in a horror movie. Having a dead cell phone, it cuts the character off not only from emergency services, but the flow of conversation in the world. Online life has become so ingrained in our society that it's become our primary form of contact and connection with the outside world. In this sense, it's become less of a predictable cliche and more so a way of building stakes and establishing sympathy for the characters who are in peril. And it's really no surprise either that isolation horror movies, they're really popular. They're by far the creepiest subgenre of horror outside of paranormal, in my opinion. These movies really tend to build suspense as the audience takes in the desolate atmosphere that our protagonist is fighting in. The idea of neutralizing the character's cell phones has become a standard language in horror movies. It's a cop-out, right? A lot of times we, we look at it as a cop-out. One type is characters being put in a dead spot where there's no reception for their cell phone. This could be because they're too isolated from the rest of the world or there's some kind of technological or supernatural interference, but that's the biggest cop-out that we see when it comes to this trope in horror movies. Though, these aren't the only ways that we can see the trope played out. Sometimes, a character will drop their phone at a crucial moment, whether it be into water or on a hard surface. A character may also put their phone on the charger and walk away from it, which makes them trapped from retrieving their cell phone later on. However, the most common is the I can't get reception line. <laughs> that's, that's the most common of this trope in horror movies. It's the standard in, in, in most of them. Though it has to be. Because at the end of the day, regardless of how much fiction horror movies are, we still use our real-life survival skills to try and dissect the realism of a movie. Cloverfield even took this trope to a new level by using it as a plot point of the film. The main character of the movie has to break into an electronics store while being attacked by monsters so that he can retrieve a new battery for his cell phone and make sure his ex-girlfriend is safe. 
It's also used quite well in the cabin horror movie The Strangers, where one of the home invaders steals a victim's phone, then places it back with the battery taken out. Jeepers Creepers is another one. Their cell phone dies because their car cigarette lighter doesn't work, which prevented them from getting a charge to their phone. So this trope can also be utilized as a form of character development, right? In indie horror movies like Siren or The Roost, the trope is used to actually signal the character's helplessness or lack of attention to detail. For example, if they'd been paying enough attention to their survival, perhaps they wouldn't be in in as big of a mess as they're in. A dead cell phone can also indicate how certain characters are going to handle the troubles that are inbound. It can be a great tool for foreshadowing a story. Will they start by blaming each other for not charging their phones? Or will they blow up, shut down? Or will they end up focusing on solving the problem and then come up with solutions? So this trope can be utilized as a foreshadow of events to come. It doesn't necessarily need to be a cop-out and a reason that these characters end up getting killed by a sadistic killer. And when you really dive deep into this trope, it's not just a tired cliche that filmmakers tap into when they have a lack of creativity. This trope channels that low-key real-world anxiety of needing a phone for specific purposes and then suddenly not being able to use one. Horror movies are meant to unnerve audiences, and by isolating the characters, it puts you in that feeling of tensity and fear of what could happen, and would anyone be able to help if something bad actually happened. Though you don't need to take away the character's cell phone to create an intense atmosphere for an isolation horror movie. The Shining, which is considered one of the greatest isolation horror movies of all time, utilizes nature to create the atmosphere. Jack Torrance is in desperate need for a second chance at life, so takes a job as an off-season caretaker to the Overlook Hotel, which is way up in the Rocky Mountains. And this makes it impossible to leave the hotel during wintertime, as the roads wouldn't be clear enough for vehicles to travel through. These types of atmospheric settings leave the audience feeling like there's no way out for the character. This is what creates that tension and atmospheric horror that isolation movies are so well known for. The key to a successful isolation horror movie, though, is realism. If the audience is wondering, oh, what about this? Or, oh, where's this? You've done it wrong. And horror movies aren't the only method of delivering isolation horror. Novels, they've done a great job as well of creating a tense atmosphere and at the same time terrifying readers. I recently picked up a collection of short stories by Joe Hill called 20th Century Ghosts. You may have heard of it. It contains a short story called The Black Phone. Obviously, this has been recently made into a major motion picture and has been critically acclaimed as one of the best horror movies of 2022. I've yet to see it yet, but I did read the short story and I thought it was pretty good, so I'm excited to watch the movie. The Black Phone short story, it's only 26 pages, but trust me, size does not matter. It's what you do with it. (laughs) And Joe Hill proves that. The story centers around 13-year-old Finney, who finds a man who needs help getting groceries into his van. When a series of black balloons exits the back of the van, the mysterious man named The Grabber kidnaps Finney and traps him in a basement room. This leaves Finney completely isolated from the outside world with no hopes of escape, though there's a mysterious black phone on the wall hanging in the basement. When Finney tries to use the phone, he discovers it's disconnected. Except, at night the phone rings, and on the other end are the whispers of previous victims who are now dead at the hands of the grabber. And most of the suffering that we witness from the character in this story is described through his internal monologue. He's a young man who's struggling to come to terms with the events unfolding around him. He's being held by a dangerous psychopath who could murder him at any time. And he also realizes that he's not the first victim to be held captive in this basement, which adds to the feeling of being alone and afraid, that isolation feeling, right? Eventually, like I said, I'm going to be watching The Black Phone, and I'm going to do a full review on an episode of the podcast, though the short story definitely created the tense atmosphere you look for in isolation horror stories. You're not sure what the motives of the grabber are, and there's moments of hope for Finney getting out of the basement. Joe Hill definitely took tips from his father, Stephen King, when he wrote this story. I will will tell you that. He wrote this in a very classic way that feels like it's a story from his father's collection of untold horror stories. That's really how I felt going through 20th Century Ghosts. So if you're in the mood for short stories, or even if you just want to see the Black Phone short story because you saw the movie, check out 20th Century Ghosts by Joe Hill. Great collection of short stories. There's a lot of fucked up stories in that book. I'm not going to lie. Pop art being one of them. But hey, great collection of stories if you're really looking for something that's going to scare you in the short term. But if you're not into books and you want to experience your own feeling of isolation and fear, you could always head down to Braithwaite, Louisiana, where there's a really spooky cabin that will invoke some of your fears. This cabin, it's considered to be the scariest cabin in the woods at night, period, end of sentence. And it's nearby to the St. Louis Cemetery in New Orleans, where you can walk among the dead and their unique above-ground vaults. 
it's actually said that at this cabin lives Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen of New Orleans. She was a dedicated practitioner of voodoo alongside being a healer and an herbalist. Laveau began a beauty parlor where she was a hairdresser to the wealthy families of New Orleans. And through this, she was able to obtain information on her patrons through gossip or servants she had to pay or cure them of mysterious ailments. With this information, she was able to enhance her image as a clairvoyant, but using these details during her voodoo consultations. Very little can be substantiated regarding the events that unfolded in Laveau's life, though there's been rumors she had a snake named Zombie after an African god and that her occult doings were mixed with Roman Catholic saints, African spirits, and Native American spiritualism. The urban legend goes that if you follow the instructions to wake her from her slumber, she'll grant you a wish. And I know that the main character of this episode's movie review probably wishes he never stepped foot in his wife's parents' place. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to review a horror movie that is a masterclass in horror films, and that's Get Out. A movie that utilizes the isolation trope in a way that keeps a grip on the viewer the entire time. Get Out was released in 2017 and was written, directed, and co-produced by Jordan Peele. It was also his directorial debut, and what a way to bust through the door and say, I'm here! <laughs> like, what a debut movie for any director, but Jordan Peele just knocked this movie out of the park. The film stars Daniel Kaluuya, Allison Williams, Bradley Whitford, Caleb Landry Jones, Stephen Root, and Catherine Keener. And before this movie, Jordan Peele was considered a comedian, right? He had the, the sketch comedy show Key and Peele, which by the way, one of my favorite sketch comedy shows of all time. I absolutely love Key and Peele. That show is fucking hilarious. And Peel actually felt that the pacing between the horror and the comedy genres were similar, with much of its success hinging on reveals. Casting for Get Out began near the end of 2015, starting with lead actors Daniel Kaluuya and Allison Williams. Kaluuya was actually casted due to his amazing performance in the Black Mirror episode 15 Million Merits, and he took the role due to the amount of personal experiences he was able to relate to from the story of the film. So after the casting call was done, principal photography got started on the film in February 2016, with shooting taking place in Fairhope, Alabama for three weeks, followed by shoots at the Barton Academy and the Ashland Place Historic District in Mobile, Alabama. The exterior and interior scenes of the house were filmed south of Fairhope, with principal photography lasting around 23 days. Now, despite the fact that this movie was filmed in Alabama, Jordan Peele is adamantly stressing that the story is not meant to take place anywhere in the South. In an interview from February 2017 with the Washington Post, Peel says that he deliberately avoided setting the movie in red state territory. Quoted, it was really important for me to not have the villains in this film reflect the typical red state type who is usually categorized as being racist. It felt like that was too easy, which it was. It would have been way too easy. But P and Peel knew that, which is absolutely epic. He's like, I don't want anybody coming at me saying I was able to take the easy way out on this and get successful. He's like, nope, we're not going to give it to them. <laughs> And I love it. However, despite this, Peel still had serious concerns regarding the film's success. He mentions to the Los Angeles Times in an interview, what if white people don't want to come to see the movie because they're afraid of being villainized with black people in the crowd? What if black people don't want to see the movie because they don't want to sit next to a white person while a black person is being victimized on screen? Fair statements and fair concerns coming from Peel. But that right there is the commentary that needed to be said in this movie. And that feeling that is being felt by anyone who feels this in the theater needs to be felt. Because while this is a fictional movie, there are still myths and urban legends in this movie that are based on truth. And they are based on truth from slavery times. And Peel takes that and goes, feel this. <laughs> Fucking feel this and live it and understand the negative impact that it has on people's lives. And I'm for it. I am all for the commentary in this movie. And I definitely think that Peel did an amazing job at hammering that home. Taking this even further, Peel had written the character Rose as a subversion of the white savior trope. And in particular, films where most white characters are evil, but one of them is good. After Rose's intentions are revealed, her soft and welcoming appearance becomes a vision of cold, meticulous elitism. It's no surprise whatsoever that this movie blew up and became the critical success that it is today. Get Out grossed $176 million between the United States and Canada, with another $79.4 million from the rest of the world. That's a totaling worldwide gross of $255.5 million on a production budget of $4.5 million. <laughs> so they made over $250 million on this movie. 
And the film was only expected to gross between 20 and 25 million on opening night. It only aired in 2,773 theaters. However, it made $1.8 million on the Thursday night previews, then went on to make $10.8 million on opening night, and then the whole box office weekend, it closed with $33.4 million. Three weeks after it was released, it passed the $100 million mark domestically. This actually made Jordan Peele the first black writer-director to achieve this feat with a debut movie. And it also became the highest grossing film domestically directed by a black filmmaker. This movie absolutely blew records out of the water. It was also the highest grossing debut film based on an original screenplay in Hollywood history. You know what movie it beat? It actually beat a two-decade long run by The Blair Witch Project. Believe it or not. And Jordan Peele obviously put together an amazing story and one that is forever etched in audiences' mind, though what truly made this movie the powerhouse it became was timing. Jordan Peele released this movie during one of the most politically charged moments in the history of society. Obviously, we're not going to get into the politics of society on this podcast because this is not the place, but the timing of this movie where everything with everything that was going on in society at the time really is what catapulted it and made a fucking statement. Now, we're going to talk about the plot of the movie. So if you haven't seen Get Out yet, this is the moment of the podcast that you can give us a pause. Go watch the movie. Come on back and listen to the rest. You got your toothbrush? Check. Do you have your deodorant? Check. Do you have your cozy clothes? Got that. What? Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might wanna, you know. Mom and Dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> I ain't never seen you like this before, bro. Meeting family and taking road trips. Don't come back all bougie, man. Come back, get your damn pants up to your damn stomach. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys coming up from the city? Yeah, we're just heading up for the weekend. Can I see your license, please? He wasn't driving. I didn't ask who was driving. I asked to see his ID. Call me Dean and you're hungry, my man. So how long has this been going on, this, this thing? <laughs> <laughs> we hired Georgina and Walter to help care for my parents. When they died, I couldn't bear to let them go. smoke in front of my daughter. I'm gonna quit. She'd take care of that for you. How? Hypnosis. I'm good, actually. Are you ready for this? I'm back in the beat. So look, I go do my research. Apparently, a whole bunch of brothers been missing in this suburb. But it's cool. Bro, how are you not scared of this, man? Couldn't see no brother around here. Chris was just telling me how he felt much more comfortable with my being here. Get out. Sorry, man. <laughs> Get out! Yo! <laughs> Bros, we gotta go. Is everything okay? Bros, the keys. Just get the keys. I don't know where they are. Bros! Sink into the floor. Wait, 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 wait. Sink. <gasps> Mom, it's a terrible thing to waste. A terrible thing to waste. Too many white people are getting nervous. <laughs> no. No. No, 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 no. A mom is a terrible thing to waste. So the story starts off with Chris Washington, who's a black photographer from Brooklyn, New York, preparing for a weekend visit to upstate New York, where he's going to meet the family of his white girlfriend, Rose Armitage. So with hesitancy, he asks Rose if her family knows about their interracial relationship, but she assures him that they're not racist. While they're there, Rose's brother Jeremy and their parents, who's a neurosurgeon and a hypnotherapist, Dean and Missy respectively, make disconcerting comments about black people. And Chris witnesses strange behavior from the estate's black housekeeper, Georgina, and the groundskeeper, Walter. One night, Missy pressures Chris into a hypnotherapy session to cure his smoking addiction. While in his trance, he confesses that his mother was killed in a hit and run when he was a child and that he feels responsible for her death as he waited too long to call for help. He then enters a void that Missy calls the sunken place. The next morning, he assumes that that whole encounter was a dream until Walter acknowledges their brief session the night before. 
However, he's pleased to discover that the hypnosis was a success. He no longer feels a desire to smoke. Absolutely amazing, right? So he's like, okay, cool. Can't be that bad then. But later, Georgina unplugs his phone, quote unquote, accidentally, draining the phone's battery. So at this house of the Armitages, there's an annual get together where dozens of wealthy white people are coming and arriving. They express admiration for Chris's physique and for black figures such as Tiger Woods, Jim Hudson, an art dealer who has gone blind in his old age. They take a particular interest in Chris's photography skills. Chris ends up meeting another black man named Logan King who behaves strangely and is married to a much older white woman. Chris relays the information to his friend, who's a TSA officer named Rod Williams. Based on his conversation with Rod, Chris tries to photograph Logan inconspicuously. But when his flash goes off, Logan goes absolutely hysterical and starts shouting at Chris to get out. The others start to restrain him, and Dean later claims that Logan had an epileptic seizure. Now, away from the party, Chris tells Rose that they should leave. <laughs> Now's the time to, well, get out. Meanwhile, the party guests hold a silent auction with Chris as the prize. Jim makes the winning bid. It's at this point that Rod recognizes Logan as Andre Hayworth, who's a missing man from Brooklyn. So they begin to suspect a conspiracy, and Rod tries to tell the police, but his claims are completely dismissed. Chris ain't having none of it at this point. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm smart enough to know when to, well, get out. So Chris starts packing to leave, and he finds photos of Rose in prior relationships with several black partners, including Walter and Georgina which contradicts her earlier claim that Chris is the first black person she has ever dated. So he tries to leave the house, but at this point, Rose and her family have locked him in. Chris attacks Jeremy, but Missy uses a trigger that she implanted during his hypnosis, which knocks him out. And this is where things get real, right? Chris awakens strapped to a chair in the basement, and in a video presentation, Rose's grandfather, Roman, explains that the family transplants people's brains into others' bodies granting them preferred physical characteristics and a twisted form of immortality. The host consciousness remains in the sunken place, alive but powerless, which is absolutely terrifying when you think about it, right? You can see everything that's happening. You can't control it, though. But you're just watching it like an outsider, watching your life play by without having any control whatsoever over it. Absolutely terrifying and really adds to that feeling of isolation and being alone and not being able to get any help because nobody knows what's going on at the end of the day. So Jeremy ends up coming to fetch Chris for the surgery and it's revealed that Chris blocked the hypnosis trigger by plugging his ears with cotton stuffing pulled from the chair. I absolutely love the nuances that Jordan Peele has added in this movie and sometimes you've really got to watch the movie even maybe three, four, five times to notice all of the small little nuances and the little Easter eggs that Jordan Peele puts in regarding society's past. It's absolutely incredible. And this, this is one of the reasons why this movie is a masterclass of horror and probably one of the greatest isolation horror movies of all time. So Chris ends up bludgeoning Jeremy unconscious and impales Dean with the antlers of a deer mount, knocking over a candle, which begins to set fire to the operating room while Jim is inside. Chris also kills Missy, but is attacked again by Jeremy as he heads towards the door. He overpowers and kills Jeremy before leaving in his car. But on the way out, he hits Georgina, who is revealed to be possessed by Rose's grandmother, Marianne, and ends up knocking her unconscious. Though he's completely compelled by guilt from his mother's death. So he decides to carry Georgina into the car, but she awakens and attacks him. And in the ensuing struggle, the car crashes and Georgina is killed. And then we see Rose again. Rose is armed and she apprehends Chris with Walter, who is possessed by Roman. Chris uses the flash on his phone to neutralize Roman, allowing Walter to regain control of his body. Walter takes Rose's rifle and then ends up shooting her in the stomach before shooting himself. Chris begins to strangle Rose, but as she smiles at him, he finds himself unable to kill her. Police sirens approach, Rose cries out for help. However, the driver is revealed to be Rod, who drives away with Chris as Rose is left bleeding out on the road. And that ending is absolutely everything. And that's kind of like... The icing on the cake for me is that ending because you were at least me, right? I'll give my thoughts on the ending and what I experienced when I first watched it. I definitely thought, I totally thought that they were going to do a racist trope at the end of this movie. I thought Jordan Peele was not going to allow a happy ending to take place. So when that cop car came rolling up and you see a white girl bleeding out, screaming for help on the road, and there's a black man over top of her, you, you're thinking, oh, great. 
are you fucking kidding me right now? This is seriously what's going to happen? Because you're expecting him to get arrested. But he doesn't. He doesn't. It's his friend Rod who ends up being the driver and he saves Chris and they leave Rose laying out on the road bleeding to death. Absolute amazing ending and I'm so glad that the character Chris got a happy ending at the end of this movie and that Peel didn't go the route of arresting him and charging him with the murder of a dead white woman. Like, so glad that it didn't end that way. But the sad part is, is that it could have. And like I said, I consider Get Out one of the greatest horror movies ever created. When you're able to incorporate realism and elements of people's lives that make them uncomfortable into a horror movie, you have yourself a movie that will stand the test of time. Because people are going to remember it, people are going to feel uncomfortable about it, and it's going to be a movie that transcends generations, right? Because it is a statement about society. It's not even just a great isolation horror movie, it's a fucking statement about society. And really turns a mirror towards the audience and goes, think about this. Think about the actions that you are doing and whether or not it is contributing to something like this. And I absolutely love the commentary. I love the message. Get out. Definitely gets 10 stars in my book. And keeping with the feeling of being isolated, imagine being trapped inside of a house with no way out and ghosts are chasing you everywhere you go. <laughs> That's pretty much the experience you can expect if you're playing the 2020 independent psychological horror video game, Visage. This game was developed and published by Sad Square Studio, and it's set in a strangely structured house that holds a somber history. Players get to control Dwayne Anderson as he explores backstories of the people who once lived in this house. Now, development of this game, it actually began in January 2015 and was successfully financed through a Kickstarter campaign in 2016. The game was conceptualized to utilize the uncanny and create a sense of fear and dread while the player experienced the gameplay. There was tons of inspiration for this game, but the main one was the was PT, the teaser for Silent Hills. <laughs> That's really what inspired this game to come into fruition. There was also some horror movies, though, that added inspiration to the game. Movies like The Conjuring, Insidious, Sinister, Ring, and Juon. And Visage has a similar setting and gameplay as its spiritual pre predecessor, PT. <laughs> the game takes place in a large suburban home in the 1980s and utilizes a first-person perspective. The player controls Dwayne Anderson, an inhabitant of the home who committed suicide after killing his wife and children. Dwayne's trapped inside the house and is tormented by supernatural entities. The objective of the game is to find a way out of the house and learn about the cause of all the paranormal activity. Now, the house is designed as a semi-open world with large sections freely explorable to the player at all times and multiple pathways to reach each area. However, in order to fully explore the map, players will need to find keys to unlock each door first and the player must face several different hazards while exploring. First, they'll have to avoid dark areas to manage their sanity, which is like similar systems in games such as Amnesia, The Dark Descent. Sanity is decreased if Dwayne stays in the dark for too long. Secondly, ghosts will create paranormal events by manipulating the house as the player explores. Examples of this include light bulbs breaking, doors slamming or opening, electronic devices malfunctioning. It's overall just a terrifying fucking experience <laughs> from start to finish. And when you witness these paranormal events, it's going to cause Dwayne's sanity to start to fall. And lastly, Dwayne must avoid being caught by the various ghosts and demons that inhabit this home. Because being caught by these ghosts and demons means instant death. So the players have to carefully maneuver through the house to avoid them. And the lower Dwayne's sanity, the more severe each paranormal event becomes. <laughs> Up to the point that a ghost or demon will actually appear and attack you. So the jump scares are also real in this game. Trust me, I know I've played this game. I've streamed this game on Twitch. I definitely got scared. And I would definitely say that this game is a terrifying horror game. Players can also use lighters, pills, light bulbs, and candles to help them avoid these kind of threats. Lighters allow the player to move through dark areas without a light, taking pills can recover sanity, and light bulbs can be used to repair the broken lights around the house, while candles are a light source that ghosts actually cannot manipulate. So there's various other items the players can find and use, like a camera or sledgehammer, but at the end of the day, the goal really is to make sure you are not staying in the dark for too long. <laughs> light that bitch up, light up as much of that house as you need to, because damn, your sanity will drop and these ghosts and demons will have no qualms scaring the shit out of you. And if you want to see Visage gameplay, Visage is going to be on my rotation of games over the next month or two here at the Cabin of Horrors on Twitch. So if you're not following us on Twitch yet, head on over to twitch.tv slash cabin of horrors and give us a follow. That way you'll get a notification every time I am live on Twitch playing terrifying games. Right now we're actually playing Madison, 
We are still going through the game Madison, which has been absolutely scary. It's the story of, well, it's a possession story, basically, where you're being possessed by a demon. You don't know why, you don't know how, but you have to figure it out and get out of the house. So we're almost done the game. So if you're listening to the podcast today on Friday, August 12th, come by tonight on our Twitch channel, because not only are we going to be playing Madison, we're going to be doing a giveaway. That's right. We are going to be having giveaways every Friday on Twitch. And tonight we are going to be giving away a free Steam key. So if you want to win a free game tonight to play on Steam, all you have to do is come over to the channel and enter the giveaway. No purchase necessary, but subscribers of my Twitch channel have three times more likelihood to win the raffle. So if you want more chances to win this, make sure you're subscribed to my Twitch channel. And that'll wrap us up for this week's episode of the podcast. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in, hanging out. I absolutely love doing this podcast. I don't know if you've noticed. (laughs) And the support that I get from all of you is absolutely incredible. And I really like the fact that all of you are enjoying the podcast episodes. It's, It's the reason why I'm still doing it. So if you enjoy this episode, if you have feedback on any of my previous episodes or this episode, feel free to message me on social media. Send me a message on Discord, whatever floats your boat. I always love to hear from my fans and I always love to add things that you guys want to hear in the podcast. And until next time,